As of this video's release, Super Mario Odyssey is my favorite game. I have this debate with one of my friends as to which game is better, Super Mario 64 or Super Mario Odyssey. It's a pretty annoying debate and I dread to think of the conversation that this video's release will start. Part of the reason it's so irritating to me is because both of us are incredibly stubborn with our opinion. He thinks that the Bowser fight is objectively hard in that game while I think that it's really easy, and we argued for about half an hour on that point for example. And I think that the reason for this is because of a nostalgic bias. Not just for him, but for me as well. Nostalgia is usually used in that context to try and undermine someone else's opinion because they only like something because they grew up with it. But the question that I have is, why is that such a bad thing? Why does it matter that the only reason that he likes 64 is because he grew up with it? He shouldn't have to try and justify why he prefers that game with something else if deep down the truth is that it's a game that's special just because it is. For 13 years of my existence, I played 64 in Sunshine and dreamed of the day that we'd get a modern adaptation of that formula, and Odyssey did that. Odyssey is a game that is special to me just because it is. I'm not going to try and justify why it's my favorite Mario game, it just is. This video is going to be me giving my honest thoughts on it, screw trying to be quote unquote objective. I have issues with the game, but what this game does well, it does so phenomenally well that I forget about them. So let's not waste any more time as we get into the Super Mario Odyssey retrospective. Super Mario Odyssey is a visually gorgeous game, despite a certain issue that I'll be bringing up now. I'll gush about the visuals in just a moment, but the dynamic resolution scaling that the game utilizes is not that great. Don't get me wrong, I will always take a better frame rate over pretty visuals, but even in handheld mode when you pan the camera really fast, the game becomes really blurry and it's really distracting once you notice it. It doesn't take away too much from the visuals of the game, but it is enough that it makes the game look less appealing sometimes. Now for the gushing I promised. There are many smaller details in the game, like how Mario's nose wobbles when you walk, the fact that you can tell that it's denim that he's wearing, to the brilliant colors in every kingdom, even the subtle foreshadowing of the end game with the moon visible in nearly every kingdom. Every one of these locations has completely different visuals, whether it's because the color palette is different from what is traditionally used to a completely different art style, no two kingdoms feel the same. The tutorial world, instead of being a grassy plain like every other Mario game that isn't entirely themed around a tropical resort has a black and white color scheme with everything dull and gray causing Mario to pop out here. The Cascade Kingdom is more of what you would probably expect from an opening to a Mario game, but even then it's different since it's prehistoric themed. The Sand Kingdom has a warmer color palette that isn't as harsh as the typical desert area in most Mario games. It combines elements from the ice theme and jungle theme as well as the giant upside down pyramid that's hard to miss. The Lake Kingdom Okay, this one is boring, but it has a nice atmosphere, so I won't be too hard on it. The cool and calming blues along with the music create a relaxing environment. The Wooded Kingdom is themed after a decaying robot society that likes flowers. Everything is rusted and overgrown, and it doesn't stick out from the pure wooded sections. The Deep Woods is a dark and quiet forest, and it gives you a feeling of unease as you look for a way to leave. The Cloud Kingdom is up in the sky, I don't know what you want from me. The Lost Kingdom takes a typical jungle theme and then tweaks it slightly with the hazy vibe and the warmer color palette. Purple poison surrounds everything and it gives the whole island a wonderful, isolated feel. New Donk City is a bustling city. Snow Kingdom feels cold and oppressive, with a humble little village located deep underground that feels cozy, despite it also being below freezing down there. Seaside is a gorgeous beachside kingdom. Wanchion is the most radically different kingdom in the game. Everything is saturated and vibrant, with solid colors and simple textures coating every surface, and everything having a rounded, blocky aesthetic. The Ruined Kingdom looks incredible, a medieval theme, dark, moody purples everywhere, decay, and well, ruin everywhere. The silhouette of a dragon off in the distance. It is truly a sight to behold in a Mario game. It's why it's so shameful how underused it is, but that's for a couple sections from now. Bowser's Kingdom is a visual treat based on a traditional Japanese aesthetic with colorful clouds filling the skies in the background. The Mushroom Kingdom is based on the castle exterior from Mario 64, and it's a great reference. 
The moon and its dark side and darker side counterparts are all peaceful and calming. Nothing around you but stars and the emptiness of space as you traverse through them. You can see the Earth from the Moon Kingdom, but for dark and darker side, there's nothing but the beauty of space around you in the sky. And the crowd cheering you on a darker side. Each one has a brochure that gives you some more details about the kingdom you're currently in, which is a level of detail that they never needed to add, but it makes it feel like the map is a physical thing that Mario actually has, which is something that I like. And that's not even taking into account how every kingdom has unique residents that are all great. There are also various outfits that you can acquire throughout the game that are purely for cosmetic purposes. Despite that, I adore the costumes in this game. Not only are there references to other Mario games, but they also add visual variety as you progress further through the game. You can completely ignore them if you want, but then you would miss out on the charm of the game. It's the type of superfluous junk that I appreciate. There's no reason for it to be here, but I just can't see the game without them. Speaking of road trips and global trips and whatnot, Super Mario Odyssey has the most perfected Mario story of all the Mario stories. The setup is fairly simple. Bowser defeats Mario, and he then teams up with Cappy to rescue Peach and Cappy's sister Tiara. And so you'll chase Bowser from kingdom to kingdom as he steals important item from each kingdom so that he can have the perfect wedding. It's nothing special, but having anything more than just Bowser kidnap Peach and go rescue her is always a good thing. Cappy is the best new character introduced in the game, and he's what every Zelda companion should strive to be. He's got a personality, and is legitimately helpful without breaking up the flow of the game, since whenever he speaks, he just appears at the top of the screen to talk to you, rather than hold everything with text at the bottom. The ending of the game is also perfect. Nintendo had been making strides to make Peach less of a damsel in distress since 3D Land. However, ending this game with her rejecting Mario and Bowser's proposals before taking the Odyssey is way better than either of these games' attempts at it. Although I will say, Mario, bro, you had nothing to worry about. There is no way that she would accept the proposal of the guy who kidnapped her and then forcefully dragged her across the entire world against her will and then tried to force her to marry him. You did this to yourself. We haven't even gotten to the music yet. I would say that 3D World has the superior soundtrack, but this game comes close. From the mysterious yet playful vibe of the Cap Kingdom, to Cascade Kingdom's theme that gets you pumped up for the adventure, Tossed Rain of Ruins being an absolute bop, Lake Kingdom being the closest theme in the series to capturing the true serenity that Dire Dire Docks did, the Lost Kingdom soothing, almost sad theme, Metro Kingdom's bustling jazz, the simple warmth of Shiveria Town, Seaside's relaxing summer vacation theme, Luncheon's playful vibe, Bowser's Kingdom having this wonderful yet sinister tune played on a variety of traditional Japanese instruments on top of classical orchestral instruments, the moon's theme being calming and space-like, I guess. These themes are all great. Even some level themes are good, most use synths and are simple and sound so unlike anything from the more grounded themes. 3D World has more tracks that I actively listen to and enjoy than Odyssey, though both are basically equal otherwise. Now let's talk about more than just a superfluous fluff. Mario has never felt better to control in any game. He has the perfect weight, turns so smooth, and it captures that feeling of Mario 64, where a lot of the fun comes from just playing with his movement controls. The role introduced in 3D World was expanded to the best way to cross large stretches of land. Long jumping out of one and then back into a roll is way more fun than it should be. Triple jumps, side flips, back flips, grandpa jumps are all snappy, and performing a string of different moves flows together so smoothly that it makes the entire game feel like a dream to control. There are several 2D sections spread throughout the game, and they're all integrated fairly decently into the game. It's not the best Mario has felt in 2D, I find he's a bit loose and floaty, though that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It does a good enough job at emulating how we felt in that original NES game without copying its janker elements. At the very least, it is fairly seamlessly integrated with his 3D platforming, with the two flowing into each other for these sections as best as could be expected. And all this before you even get into the game's main gimmick. On paper, it's a strange idea to base a game around throwing a hat, and not really compelling compared to the rest of the 3D entries especially. 64 was a 3D sandbox and encouraged exploration of the stage far more than the linear 2D platforming of its predecessors. Sunshine had a water-themed jetpack, Galaxy had gravity and spherical planetoids, and 3D World had the idea to make the closest possible conversion of 2D to 3D. Odyssey's is fairly mundane, since this game is entirely built around the concept of throwing your hat, but the amount of mileage they get out of this seemingly simple idea is staggering. Using it to break blocks, gather further away items, basing certain enemies off of throwing it, hitting certain switches, and using it to extend your jump. This makes the movement options even more interesting, as it allows you to cover either a long gap or get a bit higher. Adding it to the already amazing movement controls makes the movement even more interesting. 
But that's not the main use the mechanic gets. What it's primarily used in the game for is the capture mechanic. Back when they showed the game off in January 2017, I was excited since it looked cool. But that E3 trailer when they revealed the mechanic is what made this the most excited I had ever been for anything in my life. It is honestly one of the best ideas they have ever come up with for any Mario game. They're this game's replacement for power-ups and I couldn't care less. Sure, there are a few mundane ones like the rocket just takes you to a linear platforming level and the new donker is just an RC car thing. The piranha plants are worthless, the cactus is something moved once in the entire game and never again, and Lakitu is just a glorified fishing mini game, and I hate fishing in games. And I don't understand why so many people like this kind of stuff, but I won't look down on them for not being as enlightened as me. Anyway, despite these few boring ones, the vast majority get some interesting use throughout the game. Goombas can be stacked on top of one another and don't slip on ice, as well as making Goombat swoon. Cheap Cheeps make the underwater sections bearable since the controls aren't slow and awkward. Shivarians bounce around and that's cool, pun may or may not be intended. Meat is another worthless one, but the fact that you just take control of a giant slab of meat is funny enough for me to not care. The spark pylons actually get some interesting scenarios throughout the game, but are mainly used as a fast way to get across the map. Poles and forks propel you either up to climb something or on the ground to pick up lots of speed. Lava bubbles make exploring lava areas possible, though they only get interesting use in darker side. Moais, apart from having a great design, also allow you to see invisible platforms, which gets used decently in the Sand Kingdom. Yoshi is a little awkward to control, and I wish he had the same level of control as in 64DS, but otherwise he's generally fun to use. Glidon allows you to get to farther away areas by gliding, though like the lava bubbles, I would argue that he gets best utilized in darker side. The wigglers extend and allow you to get to far away platforms and they are flexible enough that it can create some interesting ways to move for like two moons in the entire game. Bullet bills can fly a bit so they're pretty cool. Bonsai bills are also cool since they are big. Pokios are easily my favorite new enemy in the game. They have such a great design and their ability is also good with them extending their beak into the wall allowing you to scale it. Sherms are cool in concept, being a tank and whatnot. The problem is that controlling their aim doesn't feel right, regardless of whether motion controls are on or not. Otherwise, they're passable. Bowser is the best endgame surprise for any Mario game, and he's fun to play as well. Makes you feel stronger, and saving him for the end of the game, as well as his one section in darker side, is great. He isn't overused or underused, it's just right. Well, this is great and all, but now I must break up the unbridled praise for a moment so that I can talk about the motion controls, my first major issue with the game. If there were one word that I would use to describe them, it would be inexcusable. Keep in mind that I was born and raised on the Wii, so generally I am cool with motion controls. They aren't the best thing in the world, but I feel like I tend to be more forgiving of games that use them. Since I have some of the most authority on the subject, let me tell you that the motion controls in this game are awful. It's not like any of them are required for maximum enjoyment, but the fact that some of them never got proper button controls is baffling and downright stupid. The upward throw is easily the least useful move in the game, and I can't think of any specific ways to map it to the buttons, so I'll give that one a pass. The downward throw has some legitimate applications, and to use it with button controls, you need to ground pound and then press Y. Assuming it doesn't send you into a roll, which is 50% chance of happening because both of them are assigned to happen with the same prompts. You can also spin the stick around to start spinning and then press Y to do the spin throw. These are fine workarounds theoretically and if they were implemented in a little more smoothly, I would be fine with the motion controls since they are less of a pain to use than the buttons. Of course, they are both cumbersome and require jank solutions that break up the flow of the game. Not that it matters anyway, since the game never even tells you about these options. Instead of just leaning into the motion controls while also showing you how to do with the buttons, they act as if there are no alternative ways of doing that action. And the one that I absolutely cannot figure out why there is no button alternative is the homing throw, which will send Cappy to a closer target. This is extremely helpful and legitimately has application throughout the game, unlike the other moves, which you miss out on nothing by not using them. The homing throw helps you correct any mistake you made when throwing and allows you to hit or capture something you didn't aim for perfectly. What makes it so unbelievably stupid is that unlike the other motion controlled moves, this one could have been so easily mad to the throw button with you just having to press this button again when Cappy is thrown out. But for some completely asinine and backwards reason, they didn't think of that. The excuse that they probably came up with was that you needed to decide which direction it would need to home in, but there is not one instance where you would want to use it and decide which direction you'd want it to go in. 
It's not like there's ever at any point in the entire game where there are two things that are right next to each other, forcing the game to assume what the player wants to hit or capture. Regardless, I'd be fine with the occasional moment of Cappy not going to the exact place I want him if it meant that I could actually use the useful tool that the game locked behind motion controls for some reason. That's not even mentioning the special capture abilities they locked behind it, like the Cheap Cheap's ability to attack, or the Goomba's high jump, the Uproot's higher extension, or climbing poles faster. There's no reason that these should be locked behind shaking the controller. It's not immersive, it's frustrating as heck. Outside of the horrid motion controls, Super Mario Odyssey is a game that looks and sounds amazing, has fluid and satisfying movement, and a fun, engaging, and creative game mechanic that makes playing through the game an absolute delight. Despite being a return to 3D Mario's roots, Odyssey features a few key changes to the structure of the game that distinguish it from 64 and put it more in line with Sunshine. And even then it still has a few key differences. There is no choice as to which order you visit the kingdoms in. There are two times when you decide where to go, either to pick the Light Kingdom or the Wooded Kingdom, and then a bit later in the game when you decide whether you want to go to the Snow Kingdom or the Seaside Kingdom. Other than that, it's a straight shot. It's very similar to Sunshine in this regard, though the second major difference is the lack of a hub world. The Odyssey is the closest thing that we have. The interior is very small, though you can get some collectibles that fill it up throughout the game, making it a bit more visually interesting as you progress. The lack of a hub world doesn't bother me too much, and for this game, which is basically a road trip, I don't think a hub world would have added much. It's a similar story with the linearity of the game. Since you're chasing Bowser through the many kingdoms, it makes sense that you wouldn't have too many diversions. And it's not like they don't do anything interesting with the progression. After completing either the Lake Kingdom or the Wooded Kingdom, you'll be presented with your next destination, Metro Kingdom. The one you want to go to, since that's the one Nintendo hyped up the most before the game's release. But then Bowser and his fleet show up, so you need to fight with him, only to have him fire his artillery at you, stranding you in the Lost Kingdom. Something similar happens when he summons a dragon to attack you. In a gameplay sense, this is the same thing that happened earlier in the game, but the justification for it is different enough that they both feel distinct. Plus, the surprise of a huge dragon that Bowser summons is cool. On top of this, I don't even feel like non-linearity would be something that would necessarily benefit the game. If you're going to visit every kingdom anyway, why would the order matter? Come to think of it, a completely non-linear approach would probably ruin the game as is due to how many moons are in the game. Either they would have to make the amount of moons astronomically high from a casual perspective, or risk most players from completely missing entire kingdoms. You had to get over half of the stars in 64 to beat the game, which is how they ensure that players would likely not skip any courses. You can get the 128 moons needed to get to the moon with only a casual look through half of the kingdoms. I'll get to the kingdom design in the next section, but needless to say that their design more than makes up for any issue that the linear pacing might have introduced regardless. The game has two main collectibles in nearly every kingdom, moons and regional coins. Regional coins are most comparable to the blue coins from Sunshine, though rather than getting you power moons, it gets you special items from the specific kingdom. Whether it be a special outfit, stickers placed around the Odyssey, or a souvenir to be placed inside the Odyssey. They're fun cosmetics, but nothing more. It is enough to justify looking for them all, though. Each kingdom that matters will have either 50 or 100, depending on how big they are, and they're hidden all over the place in clusters of 2 to 4. They can be in 2D sections, the platforming areas, out in the open, or hidden in the far-off reaches of the kingdom. Looking for them all requires a complete and thorough search of the entire kingdom, and it is a ton of fun. And unlike the blue coins, they aren't ever hidden behind certain events or anything. They're always out in the open, and they just require you to get to their hiding spot. Power moons are the main collectible in the game, and we'll get into some problems with them in a later section, but for now, let's talk about the best thing about them, which is how they affect the pacing of the game as well as its core loop. Since obtaining them doesn't boot you to a hub world, you can immediately continue exploring the level to find more. There are a few instances throughout the game where you'll be sent back to the Odyssey. The reason these work better than in 64 or Sunshine is because it's after a series of moons are collected, as well as after you complete a substantial portion of the story missions. Plus, whenever you are sent back, they make sure to give you either a different path to go down or at least change the atmosphere like in the Sand Kingdom where it's nighttime, and these spooky scary skeletons that send shivers down your spine pop up out of the ground. 
The most satisfying moons to grab in the game are the ones tied to the main story missions. Because the devs can reasonably expect most players to go through them all to bring peace to the kingdom, they require the most of the players out of any mission in the game, in terms of the amount of stuff the player needs to do, and not in terms of skill of course. I'll talk about it more in the next section, but every kingdom is structured with a distinct path forward with your most immediate next goal being made painfully obvious to you, allowing for a nice sense of progression with every level. And this is what makes the Lost Kingdom and Bowser's Kingdom so interesting, since these are the only two kingdoms in the game where there is no clear direction. You still get moons in Bowser's Kingdom, as well as directions to your next point. However, the game is attempting to pull a bait and switch with the reveal that the end game is on the moon, not in Bowser's Kingdom. So even though you're getting moons, you're only thinking of the final showdown with Bowser's Bowser, you likely wouldn't have been exploring the kingdom at this point, so you now have the free reign to do so without any guidance from the game itself. And the Lost Kingdom has Cappy stolen so you have an active goal before the game lets you loose to gather whatever moons you can find. The Moon Kingdom also falls into this category, but you are just trying to get to the wedding hall to finish the game off. There are no moons required, so I feel a bit more reluctant to say that it's the same feeling as the Lost or Bowser Kingdoms. In terms of moons that aren't gathered from the story, there are various ways to get them. Whether it's seeing one out in the open, with you needing to find out how to get it, a fun racing minigame that's everything the Koopa the Quick Races wishes they were, with you having to take advantage of track shortcuts as well as Mario's movement to win, entering a room that only people with a certain outfit can enter, this stupid freaking burr that takes more effort to track down than it's worth, or even just ones you get from platforming levels, there's no shortage of interesting missions. There is a certain downside, but we'll get to that later in the video. This isn't even taking into account the post-game moons, which all have their locations marked on your map, which makes finding and distinguishing them from the regular moons a lot easier. I do wish that the post-game had more to offer outside of more moons and outfits. There's not that much to them, it's just more moons, but it's not that big of a deal. The last thing to mention in this section is something that they added a few months after the release of the game, Luigi's Balloon World. The idea here is pretty simple. Players can either hide a balloon somewhere in the world or attempt to find a balloon in the world, each under the gun of a timer that you can extend by collecting coins. When trying to find a balloon, an arrow will point to the direction of the balloon as well as show you how far away the balloon is from your current position, though the arrow will only show up for a few seconds unless you stand still, which makes the actual progress of trying to find the balloon perfectly balanced between not too hard and not pathetically easy. The problem I have with the mode is that it is way more fun to find balloons than hide them, probably because I suck at it. It's just more interesting to have a limited time to try and find where someone else might have hidden a balloon rather than trying to think of a good hiding place for a balloon. There's even a ranking system system to show how much worse you are than everyone else who has played the game. You increase it with the more balloons you find in pop, how many coins you receive, how many balloons you find in a row, stuff like that. This encourages you to do better with every attempt, regardless of whether you're hiding or finding. You don't even need an NSO subscription, if I remember correctly, so there's no reason to not participate. It's a neat little mode, not much else to it. Overall, the game's structure and collectibles are both solid and make for an entertaining any percent experience. Key word is any percent. And Luigi's Balloon World extends the shelf life of the game by giving you a new way to put your skills to the test in an engaging and fun way. The kingdoms in Super Mario Odyssey are by far the most engaging and well-designed levels of any Mario game. I would say that 3D World is a more engaging platforming experience due to its sheer number of levels, but Odyssey strikes a great balance between exploration and platforming in the kingdoms. Also, this will be the bland part of the video as I'm going to go through them all and give my opinions on them since that's the only way I know how to verbally express my feelings. The Cap Kingdom, being the tutorial world, is the one with the simplest design, but it's a good tutorial allowing you to get used to the game feel. By guiding the player up this hill, for example, they learn about how the momentum feels. There's one obvious path leading up to the boss, but there is a bit of exploration involved in this main town area. Otherwise, it's just a straight line, teaching you some of Cappy's abilities, as well as giving you a breezy introduction to the capture mechanic. Cascade Kingdom introduces the concept of moons, and is one of the kingdoms that focuses on vertical progression rather than horizontal, with you having to get to the top of the waterfall. There's a bit more platforming in this kingdom than the previous, but it's still fairly light. It's a fairly condensed and small level, which works well at not immediately overwhelming the player, while still giving them the impression that this will be a grand adventure, especially with the gorgeous visuals and its sweeping variant of the game's main theme. 
The Sand Kingdom is the biggest kingdom in the game, which is a shame considering it's the third in the game, but it's not something that makes it a 0 out of 10 trash game. There's an obvious path through the kingdom up to the inverted pyramid, but there are more locations that you never visit for the main stories, unlike the others, which mostly just had little nooks off the beaten path, but nothing substantial. There's the village, the ruins, which houses the most condensed platforming in the entire kingdom, the Moai habitat, which is a missed opportunity since you only gather moon shards here, and they're unused for anything else. The oasis is fairly small, but it still gets more than one thing to do there. Jaxi Ruins is a pond of purple poison, the most notable thing about it is how it sticks out due to its contrasting colors with the rest of the kingdom. At the far northeast end of the map is a smaller ruined building that is memorable to me as it houses more moons and the Moai habitat despite not being nearly as cool. And lastly of course is the inverted pyramid. The areas in the kingdom are condensed into small chunks separated by the vast desert and the traversal of that desert is painless with the aid of the Jaxi which is a fun and fast way to traverse it. Not much else to say. The lake kingdom has a satisfying jump that you can pull off, which is even referenced by Cappy as a nice jump. Otherwise, it's definitely one of the least interesting levels in the game. It's small, there's no one particular area that sticks out, it's just the part of the Odyssey and then the part with the dome. Exploration is minimal, it suffers from a similar problem that water levels usually struggle with, that being empty space. It's fine, just nothing special. The Wooded Kingdom is a real step up, one of the best in the game. There are many distinct sections and there are many paths to take, which makes it feel way more open than the levels you explore previously. The main portion of the level is Iron Road, and it's a vertical climb with the strongest platforming that you would have seen up to this point. And despite the layout allowing for seamless paths, you are never confused where you need to go next, despite these path breaks not being that obvious, which shows how good the game is at directing the player. On top of this, there are all sorts of areas that allow for exploration, and the spaces between major landmarks are filled with more stuff, which makes it feel much more meaningful than the Sand Kingdom. There are woods around where the Odyssey lands along with this backside here, and it's generally unremarkable and not as fun to explore or move through as the main portion of the level, but it does add to the size and remind you that this is indeed a wooded kingdom. Them. The Deep Woods is an entire secret area, one that's pretty easy to miss since you need to fall off the map to find it. There's no music here, the colors are moodier, and darkness obscures everything that isn't right in front of you. There's a loud stomping that can be heard off in the distance. It's a wonderful mood, completely unique from any other place in the game, and also annoying whenever you end up here when trying to regress through the main part of the kingdom. You can't fast travel your way out, the only way to leave is to find a seed somewhere and then plant it, so if you end up down here when trying to complete a certain mission, it destroys my soul in a way that so few things ever truly do. Otherwise, a fun secret. The Lost Kingdom is isolated and dreary. It's a refreshing take on the typical jungle theme, and it's also based on verticality with a bunch of platforms surrounding a mountain. It's condensed like previous levels, but there's a better balance of exploration and platforming. These trapedals are the most annoying fiddly scumbags in the entire game, and any moon that requires them is agony. <laughs> that might be the stupidest thing I've ever put in any of these videos. I prefer going around the mountain by jumping around the edge here like a true gamer. Not only because it's satisfying, but also because I despise these things. Otherwise, there are a few interesting sections spread evenly, but I don't have much else to say about Lost Kingdom. It's just a solid level. The Metro Kingdom is what I'm talking about. Despite being a relatively small kingdom, it's super dense, acting as a playground for Mario's abilities. As such, I say it's the most satisfying bit of platforming in the game that isn't a dedicated level. The taxis give you a big bounce, the traffic lights at the traffic lights, the traffic lights act as poles you can swing on. Don't know why that was so hard to say, sheesh. There's these poles in the ground that can help you pick up a bunch of speed, you can wall jump up the side of buildings, etc. The festival is a wonderful callback to Mario's origins in Donkey Kong with more of a platforming spin. There's something about this kingdom that feels so right, probably why it's the one they initially revealed the game with. Overall, one of the best stages of any Mario game. The Snow Kingdom is okay, there isn't that much to it. The design outside of Shiveria Town is small and doesn't have that much room to run around, but the moons out here are hidden decently well. The actual town is cool, but it's also fairly small. The only interesting thing of note are the four platforming levels, uh, not much else to say. Seaside Kingdom is one of the best water levels of any game I've ever played. The main reason is that the water doesn't feel empty, there are plenty of interesting and unique things to find along the ocean floor, from the trench to various one-off challenges. 
The cheap jeeps that you can capture also make the entire thing way less sluggish and annoying to go through. Then there's the land portion of the level, broken up into different islands that are fun to traverse, the beach that you start out on having a few moons of its own, the canyon, which is also a pretty interesting location that adds a bit of depth to the kingdom. The only truly annoying thing about the kingdom is how the crazy crap store is broken up between the two different dories that also swim around the map. If you want to get something here, it's a little cumbersome, otherwise a fun level. Luncheon is one of the best kingdoms in the game. From the excellent mixture of platforming and exploration, to how the lava bubbles impact the exploration, as well as the different paths, it's the one late game kingdom that's closest to matching the sand kingdom. There's also a lot more density here, with there not being these huge stretches of land in between different interesting set pieces. The lava isn't even that big of an obstacle, mostly acting as a breather between the bigger land masses, as well as allowing for a few smaller islands out in the distance. It's also yet another level based around verticality, with you having to get to the top of the volcano in the center of the map. Bowser's Kingdom would have been a more than satisfying ending area of the game, but I am thankful that they went above and beyond for the finale of the game. Regardless, the kingdom has a cool design being broken up into a series of different islands. Making your way from island to island is fun and satisfying, and it manages to give everything a bit more of a grander scale. It's designed in a way that makes it feel like you are slowly but surely infiltrating the castle. Every individual island is distinct, and the kingdom has some of the best development of an idea of any of them, especially with the exponential way that it handles verticality with a slow ramp up before you get to this wall where it has a massive shift of verticality perfectly built up to. It acts as a pretty good fake out for the climax of the game, on top of being a fun level in its own right. The Moon Kingdom is the last in the main game. This kingdom is the big climax for the story, and as such, it makes sense that it's basically a straight line. The biggest thing about this kingdom is the heavily reduced gravity, which is satisfying. I love how the game sneaks in the typical lava section that ends most Mario games by having it be what the underground portion of the moon looks like, and it's also the best bit of platforming that exists. This is by far the kingdom that has the most imbalanced ratio of platforming to exploration, with it heavily in favor of exploration. I don't think that's a bad thing by any means, having this section be the last major platforming challenge of the base game, while the rest of it is just getting to the wedding hall, makes for an exciting climax. The ending section is also a lot of fun, getting to wreck a bunch of rocks as Bowser, with the music pumping you up, it's definitely the best possible way to end the game. I don't have much else to say about the kingdom, as outside of the story, it's fairly basic and only really alright. But for how it's handled regarding the ending of the game, it's strong, which at the end of the day, is all that matters. The Mushroom Kingdom is a nostalgia trip, and it's handled well. It's obviously a reference to Mario 64, which makes sense given how this game's main goal was to call back to how 3D Mario started. There's no main goal with this kingdom, you just wander around collecting moons, which look like stars, and play the star grab theme from 64, probably my favorite callback in the game. It's not the best this game has to offer, but it acts as a nice trip down memory lane, though it also works if this is the first Mario game you've played, or if you don't have any nostalgia for the elements it brings together. Dark Side is the only other post-game kingdom I'll mention in this portion of the video, since I'll get into my thoughts on Darker Side in the 100% section of the video. This kingdom is solid, if a little underused. It contains a rematch with all the Brutals, the main difference being that you have to deal with moon gravity, which makes them all a bit more difficult. Other than that, it features a bunch of pictures that hint to where moons are located in other kingdoms, and the main thing it has to offer, which are harder versions of previous sub-levels in the game. The rabbit and vegetable theming is strange, but I guess it works. I almost wish they did more with it, though I guess we did get the regular moon kingdom, which compensates for it, not much else to the kingdom. Now if you paid attention, you might have noticed I missed two kingdoms, and that's because they are the biggest disappointments in Mario history. The Cloud and Ruin Kingdoms are boss arenas and nothing else, and I cannot think of a single good reason for this, especially with the amazing atmosphere of Ruin Kingdom, having a cool medieval setting with a giant dragon that you fight, destroyed towers far in the background, dark purples being the main color palette, and yet this is what the map looks like. While the Cloud Kingdom isn't as much of a disappointment, it still irritates me, as a level based around the clouds could lead to some interesting platforming. Having stages previously used as boss arenas in the main game being used as full-on newly expanded levels for the post-game would have been pretty cool, but alas, we'll just have to live with the pain of not getting what should have been. The last thing to mention are the sub-levels, and for the most part I like them. They manage to maintain the general exploration of the rest of the game. There's one moon at the end of the platforming section, and then another hidden somewhere in the stage, along with maybe some hidden regional coins. The platforming here is pretty good, and there's a strong variety throughout the several kingdoms. You could be exploring a 2D platforming section, driving away from a T-Rex on a motorcycle, making your way through a series of moving platforms, navigating
navigating through a heavily clouded area, etc. And there's no shortage of these sections either, with each kingdom having them sprinkled throughout. And they act as a good pace breaker when exploring, so that you can focus on pure platforming for a bit. Although if I could bring up a problem with them, it would have to be how they're incorporated into the world. First off, they're almost always put behind a door or warp pipe. This isn't a massive issue in and of itself, but most of the time you enter a section that has a completely different aesthetic to any other area in the game. To illustrate why this is an issue for me, I'm just going to be bringing up a few examples. In the Cap Kingdom, we have the Top Hat Tower, an area that outside of the bottomless pit feels like what the inside of the tower would be like. In the Sand Kingdom, there's an entire underground temple theme and a hole underneath the inverted pyramid and this one sinkhole. The Chaxi Ruins also have this underground temple aesthetic. New Donk City Hall's interior is almost exactly what you would expect it to look when gazing at it from the outside. The moon's underground is lava based. I could go on, but I think you get the point. Far too often in the game, you'll go to a completely disconnected obstacle course floating over an abyss of nothingness. At best, you can expect it to be vaguely themed after the kingdom, like this one that you find in Tostorina Town. Sure, the platforms look like they could realistically be from the town, but it's also out in the middle of nowhere. Would it have been so hard to keep the theme intact? Growing a beanstalk to get to the clouds isn't inherently an issue, but when the platforms aren't even vaguely designed to look like they came from the kingdom you planted the seed in, it still feels disconnected. The game goes through the effort to immerse you in the world it creates doing a good job if you ask me, and then it will immediately suck you out of it for these sections. Metro Kingdom is the one that feels the most connected. There are a couple that take place in an alleyway, a few that are at the tops of skyscrapers rather than disassociated platforms in the sky, a theater, and they're the most immersive sublevels in the game because of their theming. Even then, it still has a few that aren't themed after a city, so it doesn't manage to escape this problem. Regardless, the kingdoms and sublevels are well designed and fun to go through, outside of the two boss kingdoms that aren't used that well. I would say that they are some of the best levels of any Mario game. Odyssey has some of the best bosses in the Mario canon. Firstly, the Brutals. Topper is an introductory boss, so it's no surprise that he's a pushover. He'll put on a bunch of hats and then come over to harass you. Later on, he'll do this spin attack that can be annoying, but he's a solid boss, but nothing that particularly stands out about him. Harriet will throw a bunch of bombs at you that you have to hit back at her, and then you have to avoid the series of bombs that she will drop in her UFO phase of the fight, even though it is technically identified, so I guess it would be the FO phase of the fight. She will then descend, and the fight continues as is, with more bombs being thrown until she's defeated. In the rematch later on, she just uses two braids to throw bombs instead of just one. It's a fun fight, even if, once again, really easy. Rango is easily the weakest boss in the entire game, despite being the best designed of the Brutals. He'll bounce around the area, and it's easy to avoid him. Then he'll throw his hat at you, which you just have to throw Cappy at to flip it over to get to the top of his head. The first rematch takes place on icy terrain, and he throws two hats instead of just one, and it's enough to make it slightly more interesting, but the difficulty curve isn't all that substantial. He's a perfectly fine boss, but the game offers much better ones. Spewart will spit a bunch of poison at you, where you will then have to clear it with Cappy. Then he'll go around the arena drawing a pattern, and if you just throw Cappy at him during this part, the fight becomes really simple. It's an okay fight, though I would say he's basically on the same level as Rango, being just a step above due to being a little more involved during the whole thing. The rematch with him in Luncheon is the exact same fight, just in a bigger arena, so it doesn't even feel any different. All the Brutals have another rematch and a boss rush at the end of the game on Dark Side, and for the most part, the fights are the same difficulty, though merely making the gravity lower does make the fights feel substantially different. Having to consider the slower fall speed and higher jumps makes the fight feel a little more tense, as you have to hope you'll attack them in time. And yes, I am aware that is cringe, but you can just shut up. Overall, the Brutals are perfectly fine bosses, though they are definitely the weakest in the game. Madam Brood is the first proper boss in the game, requiring you to capture her pet Chain Chomp and slam into her, all while avoiding her trying to slap Mario out of it. It's not a challenging fight, but she is a step above the Brutals. The rematch is the reason I say this, since the Chain Chomp has multiple hats and she's a little more aggressive, and the fight is more fun despite being otherwise unchanged. Nikolatek has you having to avoid his hands as they try to slam into you, slamming into ice causing it to become capturable. Then you slam into his face. As the fight continues, it has a nice progression, with him introducing a few new attacks that keep it fresh and fun despite being relatively simple. Torque Drift has you using uproot to destroy a bunch of blocks to destroy the orb it protects, as well as destroying the main core. Then you need to avoid the rings of lasers that it fires. It's not a particularly ambitious fight, but it's amusing. Special thanks to Thesaurus for providing perfect word replacements. Anyway, I like the fight. It's pretty much as perfect as a fight using the uproot can get. Mecha Wiggler would be a cool fight, but it unfortunately uses shrooms. Despite the weird aiming, the fight 
Butterfly still manages to only be hampered a little bit. You'll have to avoid the balls of electricity it will shoot at you while shooting at its weak points. Then you'll pull a Dark Beast Ganon from Twilight Princess and come from portals running in a straight line, doing so multiple times at multiple angles. After this, it's rinse and repeat. It would be a much better fight if the Sherm's aiming was better, but even so, it's still a good fight. Mollusk Lancer is one of the best fights in the game, utilizing the Gusher. The fight takes place across Seaside Kingdom. You'll have to keep up with him without losing too much water, since you'll need it to destroy his big stupid head. Although I guess you could also ground pound his head, you'd have to find another Gusher so that you could keep up with him though, so I don't find it a particularly useful way to damage him. I kinda wish he wasn't the only fight in the game that took place across the entire kingdom, though Seaside is the only one with which the concept works well. It's also the only fight in the game where I find the rematch easier, since it's always raining so you don't need to stop and refill, so it's much easier to stay caught up with him. Cookatiel uses the lava bubble, requiring you to avoid the fruit that she'll spit out at you. After a bit, she will then spew out some lava that you can climb up to hit her head. Rinse and repeat a few more times, with every phase increasing how much fruit she'll spit out, as well as the climbing part taking longer with each attack. Not a noteworthy boss, but still a fun one. Ruined Dragon is cool because it's a dragon and not a lame cartoony one either. The fight is also a ton of fun, with him shooting a bunch of these electric wheels on the ground that you have to avoid, or slamming his head down on the arena, sending waves of electricity all over the arena. He will then stop and rest, with you needing to use Cappy to remove these pins so that you can ground pound his weak point. As the fight progresses, it gets trickier with more projectiles and such that you have to avoid. While it is a little weird that this massive dragon only uses its head to fight Mario, the task of making his appearance and gameplay compatible was probably daunting. I think that what we got was about as good as possible. Robo Brood is the penultimate boss, and it's solid, utilizing the Pokio. You'll have to avoid all their attacks while using the Pokio to direct bombs into its leg, which is a mechanic that was actually subtly built up throughout Bowser's Kingdom. After incapacitating the machine for a bit, you'll have to quickly climb up it so you can damage one of the four Brutals piloting it. As the fight progresses, it gets more aggressive and slowly introduces new attacks like shooting these rings or charging at Mario. The rematch on Dark Side is also pretty good, with you having to use a Hammer Bro instead of the Pokio, as well as dealing with the Moon Gravity. It's about the same level of difficulty as the original fight, but these two changes are enough to make it feel different. Overall, another solid boss. Finally, there's Bowser. While not as good as Galaxy's Bowser fight, I still love this one. 3D Bowser fights usually utilize that game's main mechanic, and it keeps all of them fresh and interesting. Odyssey is all about throwing your cap, as mentioned earlier in the video, and it leads to a fun and satisfying boss, even if not as fun and satisfying as Galaxy's. Bowser will throw a bunch of hats around the arena, with you having to flip over the white one, which will then have you avoid a series of attacks that he throws at you, from ground pounding the arena, sending a shockwave of fire toward you, to these brick balls. Once you get to him, you'll just have to punch him a bunch, which is satisfying. In the final fight, he'll block before swiping his tail at you. There's also this one attack where you'll be with fire, and while it is easy to avoid it, it looks like a close call every time, meaning that casual players can feel like they have the good skills and have just barely avoided the attack. Or maybe my eyesight is just trash, but the point is the whole fight is satisfying, easily the second best Bowser fight in the entire series. Overall, I'd say the bosses in the game are fun for more skilled players, while also being manageable for less skilled players, which is the perfect way to end this section. Now onto the one where I complain. This is a spiel that is present in all the 3D Mario retrospectives because it's important for the context of why 100% these games. The 100% experience of a 3D platformer is one of the most important aspects of the game for me. While any percenting is fun and all, there's this specific desire to collect and do everything there is to collect and do, and with these types of games only. 100%ing Zelda is awful, but I could do Banjo-Kazooie all day. It's hard to put into words, but I think the main thing with it is because with most 3D platformers, platformers, you're already spending the whole game collecting things anyway, so the 100% one is pretty much just doing more of what I was doing the whole game anyway, as opposed to Zelda, which is entirely about the adventure and collecting stuff is merely a side activity. The closest it comes to this is beating all 120 shrines, and I would gladly do that again. And now on to the video specific portion. With that said and done, Odyssey is one of the most miserable 100% experiences of any Mario game. Granted, it's not as bad as Crash 4, It's About Time, which has become the gold standard for terrible 100% experiences, but it's still not that great. 
There are just too many power moons in this game. The idea behind having so many was to fit the handheld experience. Players can feel like they made some small amount of progress even if they only have enough time to grab one. For a casual playthrough, it's fine, but when you're a loser like me who likes to 100% their platformers, it is not a good approach. Many moons can be tedious to grab. There are so many that are just chase the rabbit down, break the rock, or ground pound the spot. Not to mention how many of them are also really simple, which leads to even more tedium. Bench Buddies is one of the most wholesome moons in the game. You get it just by sitting next to this lonely new donker, cheering him up. But that is one of the only times that a simple moon like this works. This is because the context surrounding most of these moons isn't there. For instance, every kingdom with a shop has a moon that you need to buy to complete the list. There's no challenges associated with it, you just need coins. And buying moons so that more people can access the post-game challenges is perfectly fine, but for the core 880 in the game, having so many that are just purchasing results in 13 moons that are fundamentally the same, which may not sound like a lot, but there shouldn't be so many with zero differences. The best moons are the ones that are just out in the open, since it requires you to find out how to get to it, but these moons are unfortunately not the most common. There are individual kingdoms that aren't too bad to 100%, such as Cap Kingdom, Cascade Kingdom, Lake Kingdom, Lost Kingdom, and the Moon Kingdom. There are 40 or less in each of them, so it feels much more manageable to complete them. But then you have the mind-numbing ones like Sand Kingdom, Metro Kingdom, and Luncheon. These each have 80 moons, and while there are quite a few that are fun to get, they just go on forever. It becomes a boring chore that only the most engaging of YouTube videos or podcasts can get you through. I don't have any more words to describe it, it's generally a dull experience. And it gets worse compared to other 3D Marios. Sunshine had its stupid moments, but even the blue coins felt more manageable and less nauseating to grab than the moons. 64 was equally a dull game to 100%, but it also has a seventh of the stars. Galaxy 2 had an exorbitant amount of green stars, but even then, they were at least distinct from the regular stars. They recontextualized how you went through the stages, whereas the moons never changed during the entire duration of the game. 3D World has a ton of green stars, but the stages are so short in that game, and they're all hidden fairly well. This makes the vast majority fun to grab, unlike the moons, which quickly grow repetitive around the halfway point. Your big reward isn't even that great. Platformers never really have the best extrinsic rewards for players who go out of their way to 100% the game, but that doesn't matter to me. However, for three games in a row, the big reward was a stupidly hard stage to test your knowledge and skill of the game. Odyssey lowered the requirement for this to a little over half of the moons in the game, but they still did do something for collecting 880. Not only will the Odyssey sale turn gold, but you'll also get a rematch with Bowser, and it feels the exact same as the previous boss. Sure, he's a little more aggressive, but it doesn't feel any different from the other Bowser fights, so even that isn't worth it. But it isn't just the moons that make the game so miserable to 100% since the costumes also contribute to this. There are so many coins required to buy them, and some of the later ones require so many coins that the only way to efficiently buy them is to do some hardcore grinding in this one spot in Bowser's Kingdom, only to buy one to five items and repeat. I'm fine with the skeleton being a maxed out coin counter, but when you have so many near that level, it just leads me questioning my existence out of the fifth hour of the coin grinding session. I'd rather not think of the slow and inevitable descent into death that we all go down the longer we live and why I continue to play after my thumbs have become raw. For me, I put the game down a darker side. 500 moons is the definitive end of the game, not only since it's when you are presented with the hardest challenge in the game, but also with the crowd of people cheering you on, all the different races from throughout the game that you've met being accounted for, jump up superstar playing as you enter the level, New Donk City Hall that you climb at the end, with Cappy giving his final words, basically congratulating the player for having come this far, as you otherwise silently climb the tall pole to get the multi moon. It's a solid place to end the game, especially since 500 is much more justifiable to grab the 880. In terms of the actual design, I think Champions Road barely edges it out, but this one is also solid. I think it uses the captures in creative and challenging ways, the platforming as Mario is solid, though this one section with all the platforms coming in on you as you try to make it through in time can go screw itself. Otherwise, not much else to say, just solid. Honestly, if there are only 500 moons in the game, I would have been perfectly fine with that. Perhaps even set it tied with 3D World with 100% experience, since getting those 500 moons is fun. Overall, the focus on more bite-sized challenges may work for a casual playthrough, but when it comes to hardcore gamers like me who 100% their Mario games, it hampers the experience. It doesn't ruin anything entirely, but it is still a pretty big stain on this otherwise fantastic game. Super Mario Odyssey is a special game to me, but I'm not sure if I accurately managed to describe exactly why in this video. 
from the creativity firing on all cylinders to the wonderful soundtrack, the perfect controls, the great bosses, all of it comes together to craft one of the best gaming experiences of not just the last decade, but of all time. And that's despite a bad 100% experience, a lack of complete immersion when it comes to the individual levels, and some of the most appalling implementations of motion controls I've ever seen. And none of that even bothers me enough to detract from the overall score. So for all these reasons and more, it's no wonder that Super Mario Odyssey is my favorite video game.